हेलो माय डियर फ्रेंड्स वेलकम बैक टू द चैनल एंड दिस इज योर फ्रेंड डॉक्टर सुरेश एनवी थैंक यू सो मच फॉर लाइकिंग माय अर्लियर वीडियो ऑन डेंटल सिरामिक एंड टुडे आई एम अगेन हियर विद अनदर वीडियो दैट इज क्लास टू कैविटी प्रिपरेशन एज रिक्वेस्टेड बाय फ्यू स्टूडेंट्स ऑन माय चैनल बिफोर मेकिंग दिस वीडियो आई डिड सेंड अ गूगल फॉर्म टू माई स्टूडेंट्स आस्किंग एम टू राइट that what i should be covering in this video and i got around 35 to 40 responses and i am really thankful to the students for their active participation in this effort most of the students are confused regarding the dimensions that is depth height of proximal box or the axial wall there is also confusion regarding the isthmus and the contact there are few students who asked me about the bevels and these are really good questions for the current video please note that this video is based on the principles of class 2 cavity preparation for amalgam as a restorative material if you are doing composite restoration this principle may be modified but learning it with respect to amalgam is very important because most of the final exams in india or any other country they are based on the same principles so coming to the definition of class 2 cavity preparation as per the textbook it is very simple you have a carious lesion but that carious lesion should be there on proximal surfaces but only on premolars and molars so if it is there on anteriors then it doesn't belong to class 2 and the proximal surfaces are mesial and the distal surfaces so here is a picture about class 2 cavity preparation as you can see that the decay is involving the proximal area and it also progresses on the occlusal surface diagnosing class 2 decay is a real challenge and i have seen students not giving a lot of importance to it most of the time you will have cases where the marginal ridge is intact and looking at such cases you may send the patient saying that there is no decay but please remember that the most common area for class 2 dental decay is just below the proximal contact and if it is initial it will not progress occlusally it may just progress towards the dentine from the proximal area and unless you take a radiograph you will definitely miss the class 2 so just clinical examination is not sufficient to rule out the class 2 dental decay so how do you exactly diagnose class 2 dental decay and these are the few important tips most of the time if the contact is involved in the dental decay then the patient will have a complaint of food lodgement if you want to visualize the proximal area much better then you can insert the wedge so that you have some amount of separation so this will help you to see the proximal area you can also pass the floss between the contact normally when you pass the floss between the contact and since proximal surfaces are smoother if there is no dental decay then there will be no damage to the floss but if there is a class 2 decay and the enamel margins are damaged then you can see that the floss can be damaged too this can suggest the presence of class 2 dental decay there is a very important question in most of the entrance exams and your viva that which is the best x-ray for diagnosing class 2 and the answer would be biting x-ray because in biting radiographs the overlapping between the two teeth is very minimal also since the rays pass in a particular direction the visibility of the class 2 decay is better in the biting radiograph there is a very important question regarding the caries cones in the class 2 dental decay and this frequently appears in your nbde exam if you see this image i have made two cones one cone representing the enamel cone and one cone representing the dentinal decay cone so each cone has a base and a apex if you see the arrangement of the cones of the enamel caries and the dentinal caries the apex of both the cones are directed in the same direction which is a complete opposite when it comes to pit and fissure caries where the apex of enamel caries cone and the apex of dentine caries cone are opposite in direction now let's understand what are the parts of class 2 cavity preparation the first part of class 2 cavity preparation is called as occlusal step and not occlusal box and that can be seen with the area in this picture which is highlighted by dark blue color the second important part of the class 2 cavity preparation is called isthmus and that is highlighted with a purple color isthmus is the narrowest portion of the class 2 cavity preparation and joins occlusal step with the third part that is the proximal box the proximal box is highlighted as a green color in this cavity preparation 
Apart from this, there are other important landmarks and the first landmark being the purple floor and that is highlighted with yellow color in this picture and that is quite similar to the class 1 cavity preparation. The extra wall which we will find in class 2 is the axial wall and axial wall is a wall which is parallel to the long axis of the tooth. The next important part is gingival seat and students sometimes call it a gingival floor which is not right. The next important question is which bird do you use to prepare a class 2 cavity preparation for amalgam and the bird number is 245. So why do you use number 245 bar for class 2 cavity preparation for amalgam restoration? That's very simple because the blade is designed such a way that when you use this and when it is kept parallel to the long axis of the tooth, it will give you a convergent wall which is a very important primary retention feature for dental amalgam. Also note the dimension of the burr that is diameter is 0.8 mm and the height of the cutting blade is 3 mm. Next is the design for the occlusal step. My dear students, it is quite similar to the principles and the fundamentals which you apply for any class 1 cavity preparation. I have made a full series on fundamentals of tooth preparation and I request you to go through it so that there is no repetition about the same principles in this video. However, there is one important point in the textbook when it comes to the dovetail for class 2 cavity preparation. As mentioned in my earlier video, dovetail is a primary retention feature for the class 2 cavity preparation. But the textbook says that if you have extended your cavity preparation buckar or lingual features, then you don't require a dovetail. So let's talk about the design of the isthmus. And this is a very important question in your viva and your entrance exam. And most of the time students say it is one fourth, one third without realizing the fact that it is not the restorative material which decides the width of the isthmus. It is the width of the isthmus which decides the type of restorative material which you can use in that class 2 cavity preparation. For example, after you do a cavity preparation and removal of the caries, if you find the width of the isthmus is less than one fourth of intercuspal distance, then this restoration can be done with an amalgam. But if the width of the isthmus is, is more than one fourth but less than one third of intercuspal distance then you cannot do amalgam here you have to go for an inlay similarly if it is more than one third of the intercuspal distance then it has to go for an onlay since you understood the design of the occlusal step and the isthmus let us now understand the steps involved in preparing the conventional class 2 cavity preparation. The steps for the occlusal step preparation is quite similar to preparing class 1 cavity. You start from the uninvolved side and then go towards the proximal side where the caries is situated. But you will have to stop at an area so that you are retaining a 0.8 millimeter of marginal ridge on the side where the caries is situated. When you do this, you will find a very important landmark that is the dentino enamel junction and this is situated in the area where you would like to prepare the proximal box. In this picture, the DEJ appears in dark red color in both the images. Few students get confused and ask me why do you have to retain that 0.8 mm of marginal ridge? Why not completely remove it? The idea of retaining the thickness of marginal ridge is to prevent damaging the adjacent teeth when you are making a proximal box. You can also place a wedge while doing the cavity preparation in order to prevent the damage to the adjacent teeth. But please note that many exams do not allow this during the examination. But if you are not giving the exam, I would recommend that you should follow that technique. Now let's talk about the most confusing aspect that is the configuration of the proximal box. When you talk about the proximal box, there are three important questions. One, width, height and the depth. And this is really confusing and I am trying to give you the exact terminology as per the textbooks. The first is how wide is the proximal box. When somebody asks you the width of the proximal box, they generally mean that is the buccolingual width. Second is how deep you would go gingivally. This is asked by many terminologies by the teacher. For example, what is the height of the proximal box or what is the depth of the proximal box gingivally as per the textbook. The third important point is how deep you will go axially and the textbook mentions it as the dentine depth of the axial wall. 
So let's talk about the first aspect that is the buccolingual width of the proximal box. That depends on two aspects. One is the buccolingual extent of the contact and the amount of the caries. In this first scenario, you can see the size of the caries is less than the buccolingual extent of the contact. So the point to remember here is after removal of caries, you should not stop making a proximal box. You have to make sure that you break the contact and get a clearance. And what is the meaning of clearance is basically means that the walls of the proximal box are beyond the contact area. But the problem is students keep on widening it without thinking where to stop. For this, you have to remember that you have to push the proximal box beyond the contact so that you only get a clearance of 0.2 to 0.3 millimeter at each side. You can check that by passing the tip of the explorer between the two teeth. And the explorer is not passed in the occlusal embrasure. It has to be passed in the midsection where the contact is situated. If more of the instrument is passing beyond the contact, then it means the proximal width is more than what is required. The second scenario where you have caries which is more than the buccolingual dimension of the contact and in this situation the primary objective is to remove the caries first. Since it is more than the contact you will end up getting more clearance but that's absolutely all right. The problem of having a wide proximal box is you will have difficulty in building the proximal contact with the restoration if it is a direct restoration. And second, since the amount of tooth structure in this area will be less, that there is chance that tooth may fracture. In these situations, it is better to use advanced matrix system. You can go for secondary resistance and retention feature or you can go for an indirect restoration where the building proximal box becomes easier. Also note, since you have to make occlusal convergence in the proximal box too, if you measure the width in the gingival level, it will be more than the width what you will achieve in the occlusal area. In this aspect, we should also know that we have to give reverse curve in the maxillary molar. I have already made a video on reverse curve and I will leave the link in the description. Do watch it. The next aspect is how deep you will go gingivally and that is the height of the proximal box or the depth of the proximal box gingivally and not axially. The height of the proximal box decides where exactly your gingival seat is situated and this also depends on the same two factors that is the presence of the decay and the occluso gingival extent of the contact instead of buccolingual extent of the contact. Let us take the first scenario where the size of the caries is smaller than the occluso gingival extent of the contact. So where will you establish your gingival seat? Very simple. You have to remove the decay first. But if you make your gingival seat here, then your gingival seat will be inside the contact area. So you have to take it below the contact so that you get a 0.5 millimeter clearance gingivally and this is verified by passing a tip of a probe. If in this situation more of the instrument is going beyond the two teeth that indicates your height of the proximal box is more than what is required. Let's take the next scenario where you have a decay but the extent of the decay is larger than the occluso gingival extent of the contact. And the first priority is always to remove the decay. And in this situation also if you remove the decay your gingival seat would be deeper than what you would normally have compared to the earlier situation. And this means that you will get a clearance which is more than what is required and that's okay because the primary aim is to remove the caries. Now let's talk about the last dimension that is the dentinal depth of the axial wall. Please note both the pulpal floor and the axial wall should extend into the dentine even if the caries is located in the enamel. The minimum depth of the pulpal floor into the dentine would be 0.2 mm below the dentino enamel junction. But for the proximal box, the depth would range from 0.5 to 0.8 mm depending on at what level you are measuring the axial depth from the dentino enamel junction. So how do you establish the axial wall depth into the dentine? In order to do that, you have to remember that I showed you this picture where we saw the presence of a DEJ into the floor of the cavity preparation. And at this point, you will keep your burr 
which has a dimension of 0.8 millimeter and you should make sure that two third of this burr is inside the dentino enamel junction and remaining one third of the burr is outside this dentino enamel junction. So if you start cutting the tooth and going gingivally, you are also establishing the height of the proximal box now considering the earlier factors which I have already mentioned. Then you are also creating the axial wall which will be situated inside the dentine minimum 0.5 millimeter because two third of the burr is inside the DEJ. So at the end of the cavity preparation, you have made an axial wall, you have widened the proximal box, you have made a gingival seat, but you have still left the enamel shelf which is protecting the adjacent tooth from getting notched. Now you will make two extra notches on this side of the proximal box and you will take a hand instrument to break it and then you can also use an enamel hatchet in order to remove the undermined enamel which is left on the sides of the wall that is buccal wall of the proximal box and the lingual wall of the proximal box. And now for those students who have asked me the dimension of the gingival seat, please note that there are two dimensions of gingival seat. One, the buccolingual width of the gingival seat that is similar to the buccolingual width of the proximal box and that we have already covered. The second thing would be the axial depth of the gingival seat that basically means that if you are pushing the axial wall more inside the dentinoenamel junction, axial depth of the gingival seat will also increase. At this point, I would like to mention an important question which commonly appears in the exam is how should be the configuration of axiopalpal line angle that is the junction where the axial wall and the pulpal floor meet. This area should always be beveled or rounded for two reasons. One, it reduces the amount of stress which occurs at this fulcrum area and the second, if you are making it round or beveled, you are also increasing the thickness of restorative material at this junction making the restoration more strong. One last question which we will cover now is do you give bevel in cava surface margin for the amalgam? There is only one area where you have to give bevel into the class 2 cavity preparation and that is gingival cava surface margin and the question is why please note the enamel wall will be strong only if it has full length of enamel rods in the occlusal area when you give a 90 degree cava surface angle you will end up having the wall with having a complete enamel rod that does not happen when you have a gingival seat in the cervical area because the enamel rods in the cervical area are not directed in the similar fashion comparing to what you have into the rest of the area. In the cervical one third, the enamel rods are apically directed. So even though you may think you have made a 90 degree KO surface margin here, which is recommended for amalgam, but you are making a wall of the enamel, which has incomplete enamel rods because of its angulation. And this margin will fracture eventually when a lot of load is put on the proximal restoration. That's why you give bevel of 20 degree in this area with an instrument called as gingival margin trimmer to remove the unsupported enamel rods. Please note if your gingival seat extends to the cementum then you don't have to give the bevel and of course the reason is simple because there are no rods in the cementum. So before ending this video, there is a small quiz and I hope that you will answer it into the comment section. And the question is, why is the radiographic extent of the carious lesion always less than the clinical extent of the carious lesion? And this is important to know because this is the exact reason your teacher will reject your class 2 case even if it is slightly deep. If you have any more doubts, please write into the comment section and I will try to make a separate video to answer those questions. If you like the video, please don't forget to click the like button and subscribe to our channel and share this video with your friends. I will see you once again with one more video very soon.